As President Obama's nominee to chair the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission appears before a confirmation hearing, we ask what role should nuclear power play in America's energy future? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Shihab Rutansi. Alison McFarlane, President Obama's nominee to head the body that regulates nuclear safety in the U.S., is a geologist and expert on nuclear waste disposal, though she describes herself as a nuclear agnostic. If confirmed, she'll replace Gregory Yatsko, whose eight-year tenure was plagued by battles with the industry and Congress as he attempted to bring in new safety regulations. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission oversees the country's 104 nuclear reactors, which generate 20% of the country's energy. All are nearly 40 years old. The earlier this year, approval was given for the building of new power plants in Georgia and South Carolina. Following last year's Fukushima disaster in Japan, international safety concerns about nuclear power have intensified, with Germany announcing it will shut all its nuclear reactors by 2022. Critics in the U.S. point out that a quarter of American plants are the same model as the stricken reactors at Fukushima. And there remains no plan for disposing of the 65,000 tons of nuclear waste currently stored at the U.S.'s power stations after a proposal to build a waste disposal site at Yucca Mountain in Nevada was abandoned in 2009. Nonetheless, advocates of nuclear power argue it should play a crucial role in America's energy future as the country looks to produce more, quote, clean energy and reduce dependence on fossil fuels. So what kind of future is there for nuclear energy in the U.S.? To discuss this, we're joined from Burlington, Vermont, by Arnie Gunderson, who has over 40 years' experience working in the nuclear industry. He's chief engineer at Fairwinds Associates, and he co-wrote the Greenpeace report, Lessons from Fukushima. In the studio are Mindy K. Bricker, editor of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, and Jack Spencer, a senior research fellow in nuclear energy policy at the Heritage Foundation. Arnie Gunnison then first, we were looking at the confirmation hearing then for a new chairman of the, the regulatory, the Nuclear Regulatory Committee. What happened to the old one there? What, what happened to Gregory Yatsko? Well, he's had a contemptuous um, uh, uh, relationship with Congress for about eight years. Uh, my opinion, he's just a regulator trying to regulate and that congressional pressures to keep these plants running uh, despite safety problems have actually caused a conflict between the chairman and, and Congress. And uh, this year, the, the conflict rose to the point where he decided the best thing for him to do was to resign. And Alison McFarlane, uh, Jack Spencer, then is seen as acceptable to all sides. Certainly the Nuclear Energy Institute, the, the nuclear lobbying company, has come out in her favor. So what does that mean, do you think? means that she is a more or less status quo sort of candidate that um, across the board people generally support. I don't think that's the end of the story. I think that there are serious questions to be had about her. I don't, it's not my position to support or, or not support her, but, um, you know, I think that there were broader questions with Gregory Yatsko than just what we heard Arnie talk about. I think that, that to be a regulator, whether you're for or anti, uh, for or against nuclear, you need to come into it from an unbiased position. And I think that from, uh, from Dr. Yatsko's position, specifically his position on Yucca Mountain. He allowed his political um, positions that he held prior to holding that, 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 that seat um, really influence how he conducted his affairs um, in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Now, whether or not uh, Dr. McFarlane or not has that same sort of dynamic, I think will go a long way in deter determining whether she runs into the same sorts of problems. All right, Mindy K. Bricker, she was actually one of your colleagues, I guess, at the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. So you, know, you know a bit more about her. She describes herself as an agnostic. She's a geologist, which seems particularly pertinent given that the major issue perhaps right now arguably is this uh, issue of storage at Yucca Mountain. So what, what, would you, what would you think her position is going to be? I mean, is she, is she, uh, has she made a decision, do you think, on Yucca Mountain? Because she has actually spoken out in, in the past against it, hasn't she? Well, she has published on Yucca Mountain, and I, I certainly cannot say how you know, how she will move forward on Yucca Mountain. I think that there are a lot of things um, that are at play there. She is a geologist, as you said, so she um, looks at storage of nuclear materials in a very different... Perhaps you can explain them very briefly, uh, mm -hmm. Mindy, the, the, um, 
the, the issue of Yucca Mountain. What is Yucca Mountain? What is proposed for Yucca Mountain? Where is it now, actually, the proposal? Well, that would be probably something for one of my other colleagues, I would say. All right. Um, Arnie, why don't you take that one? Well, the, the choice of Yucca Mountain was never a scientific choice. It was, it was political from the get-out. When the, when the bill that picked Yucca Mountain was uh, pushed through Congress, it was affectionately called the Screw Nevada Bill. And ever since then, we've been trying to get the science to fit a political decision. So I think you know, Chairman Yasko has, has recognized that and said the science doesn't match the politics. And it's time to put, the, uh, well, put this in the opposite well, order. Let me jump in Find here. a good site and move forward. Let me jump in here. I disagree with what was just said, but let's assume that was all correct. The NRC has a staff whose job it is to review the technical merits of applications for new reactors for Yucca Mountain. So if, even if all that was true, which I disagree with, but if it was, that application for Yucca Mountain has been submitted to the NRC staff. They've carried out their technical review of that. Now, if we agree that the NRC staff is capable of carrying out its mission, perhaps there's disagreement on that. But if we agree with that, let's allow them to look at the Yucca Mountain application and make a judgment based on its technical, technical merits. All right, I think we need, to, we need to just go back one step quickly here, though, because I mean, what we're talking about here is the, the storage and disposal of nuclear waste, which is often overlooked, actually, in, in some senses, uh, as opposed to the actual safety of the reactor. But, of course, the, the nuclear waste itself afterwards is potentially as dangerous, more dangerous, perhaps, than, than, than the reactors itself. What is the science, Arnie Gunnison? I mean, the, the, the thinking behind Yucca Mountain is the, the safest place to keep this incredibly dangerous material that is created as a result of nuclear power um, is through geological formations that are impervious perhaps for hundreds of thousands of years and therefore and while the, while, while the radioactivity dies down. Is that about it? And, and why is Yucca Mountain not uh, suitable then, do you think? Well, certainly underground storage has to be the ultimate, uh, the ultimate solution. The, you know, the problem is with Yucca that it is volcanic and, and also is subject to seismic issues. Um, it happens to be near where we tested our nuclear weapons, which is the, the sole reason it was chosen. But there's many, many better places in the country um, that would be a, a, a firmer location to hold the material uh, if you went about the scientific process um, correctly. But how is it possible that e even, and we still haven't solved this problem then of what to do with nuclear waste, and yet plans can still be afoot to build more nuclear power plants without that, well, that, that foresight? Well, I perhaps, think we need to be clear on this. I think that it's not that, there, that we haven't figured out how to deal with nuclear waste. There are lots of ways to deal with nuclear waste. We can put it in Yucca Mountain, some other geologic formation. We can reprocess it. We can let it sit on site and allow the radiotoxicity to, to, to go away over 100 years, largely, and have much less dangerous stuff to deal with. There are lots of things we can do with nuclear waste. What we don't have is a system in place that allows us to carry out any of those things. And the reason for that, I would say, is quite simple. We put the government in charge of this. The government can't do nuclear waste management. We're seeing that here. It can't do it. The private sector produces the waste. I would propose that the private sector should manage its own waste. The role of the government in that situation should be to provide oversight to make sure you can't just throw it in the river or put it in a hole in the, in the, in the ground that's not safe. So get, let the government do oversight. Let the private sector determine what to do with the nuclear waste, and we have all these options. They'll come up with the most economically rational way to all do right. it. Well, I think this issue of, of, of the, the division of labor between private and, and public is crucial to this, this debate. But, but before we get into that, then, let's remind ourselves as to uh, how many nuclear reactors the U.S. actually has. It's home to nearly a quarter of the world's commercial nuclear reactors. Out of 434 reactors in the world, 104 are within the United States. Uh, and Mindy K. Brickler, as these debates continue about what to do with the nuclear waste produced, uh, the understanding is then that, that in the main, this nuclear waste is held above ground, uh, sometimes on the roof of the plant and so forth. I mean, is that what's going on? Many, and many of these, uh, what was it, 23, I think, of those plants are actually the same, um, the same model as, as, as we had in Fukushima. So therefore, uh, you know, they, they, they are on site, basically. And we've seen problems with that in the past. So that's why this is such a dangerous and frightening prospect, perhaps. Yeah. Yes, we, I mean, there is interim storage. So as you, as you mentioned, we, um, there are spent fuel pools, um, dry cask storage as well, which we saw in Fukushima, um, and which was largely a success story looking at what happened at Fukushima and what didn't happen with the dry cask, um, which are kind of capsules um, that hold the, the nuclear waste before it goes to a final um, repository. So... 
Um, but what, what, Arnie Gunnison, then, what are the main dangers then of having the spent fuel on the site of the, of the reactor itself? Well, I would agree that the, the best way to, to store it right now in the absence of any long-term storage is to put it into these, these dry casks that are not water-cooled. Um, Fukushima had those dry casks, and they were perfect. They, over, they rode through the earthquake. They rode through the tsunami just fine. The problem is we've got all of this nuclear waste sitting in pools that have to be actively cooled with water. And the 23 reactors you were talking about are particularly vulnerable because the fuel is essentially on the roof of the building and not in a hardened building. Right, I mean, that's the point then about Fukushima then. It wasn't necessarily the casks, it was, it was the, the cooling mechanisms around the casks that, 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 that were the big problem, correct? Yes, well, and the, 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 the better or, way of or, doing or exactly, it is the ones to get the pools, it on the ground. Oh. Sorry. Go on, Arnie. Yeah, the better way to do it is to get it on the ground and, uh, and let it be passively cooled with air. Mm -hmm. um, so what about then th this idea that perhaps if you privatize um, the disposal of the fuel, then maybe that would be the solution given the paralysis of government to sort this out, Arnie? Um, I would agree government is paralyzed. Um, I don't think that that means that it has to be paralyzed. And the NIMBY problems, the not-in-my-backyard problems um, that we see with, with uh, waste storage right now, I don't think go away if we, um, if we privatize the solution. Um, at the core of it, it's a, it's a not-in-my-backyard. And um, we've got to resolve that, whether it's through private or through, a, um, uh, you know, through the government. If, if, just one quick word on this. I mean, what it... The dynamic of changes is the incentives. So once you privatize it, you take the incentive away from politics and put it into, put it, give that responsibility to the private sector. They can't engage in profit-making activities. But Producing electricity with nuclear power. But there's skepticism here because there's a general lack of trust uh, and a sense of lack of transparency in the industry as a whole in the way that the regulator well, and the oversight well, is conducted and the relationship with the, you know, the private sector well, and let, so forth. Let's which look, which let's probably, look at, I mean, there's a suspicion this will just basically privatize the profit and nationalize the risk as the nuclear industry always well, no, used to do. Perhaps. Well, well let, I'm not for that. It should be privatized. What we ha what, if, look at the industry as a whole. If you look at nuclear power, um, uranium mining, enrichment, fuel fabrication, plant operations, everything, was once very much in, a pu in the public realm, has been privatized over time. As the privatization occurs, you see safety increase, you see efficiency increase, you see new businesses being introduced, you see new technologies being introduced. The one area that, that the whole system has been shut down, it's nuclear waste. That's the one that set, stays in the public sector. If you look around the world where you've had successes, you have more privatization, or at least you have the waste producer being in charge of waste management. It's that disconnect that is, I would argue, the heart of the problem we have in this country. Uh, but Arnie Gunnison, I mean, arguably people have said as pri the private sector gets more involved, actually things get more corrupt and, and the, uh, th the, the, the relationship between regulator and private sector becomes too cozy. The regulatory agency, certainly uh, in the U.S.'s case, has become, was actually told to be less combative because people in Congress were being lobbied so hard by the industry. Yeah, my problem is, as you said, about the, uh, the, the privatizing of the gain, but then when the, when the business ultimately goes out of business, then we've socialized the risk. And you know, the, the, the mining issue is an example where uh, uh, when the plants are run, they're run in accordance with regulation, but when the owner walks away, the um, usually indigenous people on the land are stuck with liabilities. We've got the same issue with, um, um, on the back end, with the nuclear waste storage. When the corporation that put that stuff in the ground goes out of business, then we all carry the, the risk for as long as several hundred thousand years. Mindy K. Bricker, how is the regulatory structure working currently? I mean, AP, the Associated Press, recently, recently did an investigation where they seem to suggest that uh, you know, after they were warned in the 90s, and in many ways the role has been to lower safety standards as the nuclear industry comes to them and says, hey, look, we've got a problem here. And, and, the, and the response tends to be from the, regula agency, the regulatory agency, well, in that case, will lower, will lower the safety standard and not necessarily, not, not necessarily to, be, to be combative at all. What's your sense of this? Well, I think that there, there is m more to it than that. I think that you, there is a science behind that. There hasn't been um, a lot of research, though there is, is more in the last five years on low dose radiation. And so there has to be, you know, that has to be considered too, just rather than having kind of a knee jerk reaction. 
um, the science has to be there to support different regulations and not that those are current by any stretch of the imagination, but there is some reason for them to be a bit slower than what the public would like. And Jack Spence, I mean, you, you trust the regulatory agency then? You think this, this could potentially be all about science? There isn't simply, as with so many regulatory agencies, this revolving door between industry uh, and, and regulator, which means, frankly, um, and, and, and a lack of transparency, frankly, that, that well, means we don't really trust them, actually. Well, I, I, it's not for us to trust or not trust a regulatory agency. Isn't it? It's for us, no, it's not. It's for us to trust a regulatory regime <laughs> that ensures that we have safe operations. And what we have in the nuclear industry is precisely that. You have a federal regulator that sets guidelines, but you also have the Institute for Nuclear P Power Operations, which is a private regulator that, ha that shares information am amongst the different plants. It has an important role. In the United States, you have a situation where you have uh, utility-specific, plant-specific regulations and rules where you, have, where you have the plant operator who can shut that plant down at any time. They're not calling the prime minister to find out if they can shut the plant, if there's a problem. They can shut it down at any time. It's the way these things interlock together together that give our system of regulation, or that make our system of regulation, I think a very effective and efficient one. Arne Gunnarsson, is the regulatory system then efficient? What is the state of, uh, what are, is the, state of the, the, the nuclear reactors that we do have currently online in the U.S.? Is the NRC catching any problems that they might have? Well, you know, there's been uh, 70 or 80 plants have asked for life extensions, and all of those have been granted. Over 100 power increases have been asked for. All of those have been granted. So in general, um, the, the NRC gives the industry what it wants. There is one exception, though, and I need to pat the NRC on the back. Out of Fort Calhoun last year, where there was a flood, and it would have been much worse had the NRC not done its job the year before, forcing some, um, uh, some flood protections that hadn't been there before. So yes, periodically the regulator does its job, but most of the time there's a knee-jerk reaction to keep them running. I mean, you, you wrote a report, or, or, or contributed to a report, rather, um, about the lessons of Fukushima. Uh, beyond the, the manner in which these reactors are built, the design uh, flaws, arguably, about the, having pumps along the ocean to, to give that, that essential cooling water and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, issues of backup power, which are so important at Fukushima, again, to do with cooling. Uh, a lot of this was to do with the regulatory structure, the, the links between government um, and the industry in Japan. How does the U.S. compare, would you say, then? You know, I, I think that uh, the Japanese were just unlucky. Um, if it happened in the United States, and it could, it wouldn't be a tsunami. It could be a, a dam burst upstream of the uh, of the Oconee units or a, uh, a terrorist attack. But if we were unlucky, we would suddenly see the flaws in our system as well. Um, the the Japanese just had the bigger breakdown first, and now we always say, well, the, the Japanese had, you know, all these inherent flaws. I think it's inherent in the system in all the countries. Look, it, we, if we had a similar situation, you would see the weaknesses in our system. I agree with that. But to simply say they were unlucky, that's not giving credence to the, the science behind the way you operate a successful and safe nuclear power plant. I mean, there were specific things that they chose not to do for whatever reason. There were certain regulatory infrastructure realities that they were dealing with that they chose to do. And if they had been different, they would have had a different outcome, I would argue. So it's not they were unlucky. Um, there's never an excuse, I would argue, for that to happen, what happened there. You, if you're going to build a nuclear power plant, you need to withstand floods and, 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 and earthquakes and things. That doesn't mean your nuclear plant's going to keep operating as a result of those things, but you've got to protect the public health and safety from you know, spewing radiation. Um, I just deny that it, it was a luck thing. And do you think that's possible then? I mean, is, is, would it be possible to, to have all those safeguards in place to make a perfectly safe nuclear reactor then, do you think? to have all of the safeguards right. in place to make I mean, to, a... To, to really go through all the credible risks or the credible events, I believe but it's called. But you're only as good as the risks that you know about. Right. So there's always something that is unknown that could emerge and that you have a plan for. I mean, the risk analysis, what your probability, you try to account for that. And that's what happened at Fukushima and TEPCO employees presented, I think, in Florida on the earthquake that, you know, that we all now refer to and say, how did they not see that? Um, so they were vocal, they were publishing on that, and it was ignored. Jack Spencer, so we got this picture then of, it still hasn't really been solved, certainly in the U.S., then, as, as to what to do with nuclear waste. We have uh, the, frankly, the, perhaps the impossibility of, of, of planning for all possible events for what could be 
you know, a, a very dangerous nuclear reactor in, in within certain events. And then we have the coziness of um, regulators and politicians and so forth, uh, perhaps in the system, both in Japan and in the US, it would seem. I mean, are you seeing now perhaps why some people are, you know, feel that this is inherently, it's just not worth the risk, frankly? Well, I'll give you number one, the waste thing. I don't think number two and number three are real problems. I don't think that you have that coziness that you just described. You have you have ebbs and flows in how the, reg the NRC is, is maintained and operated, but you have these different layers. In, in the United States, I mean, you have a system that, from a regulatory standpoint and safety standpoint, that works. Just look at the numbers. We operate re really efficiently and, and very safely. Uh, um, from, you know, from the, so so I, I deny the premise of your question there. President Obama now, uh, Arne Gunnison, I mean, when he was in Chicago as a politician, he seemed to be quite critical of the nuclear industry. Now he's very gung-ho. What's his connection with the nuclear industry, would you say, then? Well, the, the early money on the Obama campaign for president came from Exelon, which has an enormous number of nuclear plants in Illinois. Um, some of his key bundlers, the people that got millions and millions of dollars into his campaign, came from Exelon and were instrumental in his choices within the, um, the energy decision-making policy in his, uh, in his cabinet. So um, I never thought that President Obama was uh, anti-nuke. Uh, frankly, I, I thought he was uh, uh, influenced by Exelon from before he was elected. I think it was pretty clear. So that, that's another layer then, I suppose, which at least leads to you know, an inkling that perhaps all is, is not as it may seem. And there's this idea of transparency and oversight, again, that keeps coming up. And then finally, you get to the, the, the issue, the fundamental issue, that frankly, nuclear power plants aren't cost effective in the first place. Wall Street won't finance them. They rely on taxpayer subsidy to, to a great extent. They don't even make sense, perhaps, for some, you know, even on a financial level. They're not cost effective. And then because we're running out of time, I'll, I'll meld it in with, with the supposed green credentials of, of nuclear uh, power stations. Uh, that, you know, once you look at their, their entire carbon footprint, they're not terribly green either. So again, I mean, if, if, you, if you determine you know, the greenness of something by carbon, that's one thing. I look at it from an emission standpoint, and I think that nuclear is very green. But let me let me just on the cost issue. Me, well, well, I don't want my president to be for or anti-nuclear or any any other energy source. I think that energy production should be an economic matter. I want my government to make sure it's done right. safely. And the argument is on an economic matter. On, it's, on, it's a on non-starter. Non no, it's not a non-starter. We have five plants being built in this country right now two of which are being backed by the taxpayer through loan guarantees, two of which aren't, one that start, was started in the 1970s. That being said, I argue that we should get rid of all subsidies for nuclear power and all energy sources. We should have a regulatory environment that allows all energy sources to compete. And I think that the problems we have with nuclear in this country is that we have a regulatory environment that doesn't allow new technologies to be introduced as quickly as what they, they should be able to. We have the, the whole nuclear waste thing, I think, s sort of fumbles the whole process and the whole, um, the, whole evolu the whole evolution of nuclear power. So we need to get the policy right. Then we can see if the economics come along um, for nuclear energy. These should be economic decisions, though, not political ones. Arne Gunnison, it, it, do you, could you see a future in which there is a cost-effective, safe nuclear industry in the United States? Well, a, a month before Fukushima, I was saying that, yes, I thought that uh, that was a, certainly a possibility. Uh, Fukushima taught me that uh, this is a technology you can have 40 great years and one bad day and, uh, and ruin a country as a result. So um, I guess I get to the point that Fukushima has pushed me to the point where the, um, the downside risk of that one bad day uh, overcome any advantage of the 40 good years. Mindy K. Brickner, we are seeing a backlash now locally uh, as, as far as tax guarantees and, uh, for nuclear power plants and, 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 and other issues actually around the country. I mean, might, might that in the end sink the nuclear industry perhaps more than any safety concerns or concerns about where to put nuclear waste and so forth, you think? No, I think, um, I, I do think that we are kind of overlooking a very big issue today, which is nuclear waste. And I think that we led into this with Alison McFarlane, which there is a reason that Obama is considering her um, and the waste issue if not handled could could really damage the I mean could could damage the industry because when you run out of space to store your um, spent fuel you can't continue producing more waste and so there needs to be a final repository for that um, and you know you have I think you've mentioned there are over you know 400 nuclear power plants in this world in 30 countries there's 60 countries that have expressed interest in acquiring nuclear energy 
Um, and all of that, whether it's current and it's operating or if it's planned, it's going to generate waste. And those, um, I think it's worth mentioning that in the- Very briefly. Uh, yes, in the spent fuel pools right now, many of them in the United States as well as abroad, um, are at, I mean, they are holding four times the amount of spent fuel than they were designed for. All right, so still lots of questions. Minnie K. Brickler, thank you very much. Jack Spencer, thank you. Thank you. Arnie Gunnison, thank you very much too. And that's all from the team in Washington, D.C. for now. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook, where you can find more information about the program. And we want to hear from you. Tell us what stories you think we should be covering. Send your ideas directly to us at insightstory at aljazeera.net.